Hello, my name is Sarah McCaffrey and I'm the manager of interdisciplinary arts at Asia Society. Thank you so much for joining our virtual book club. Tonight we'll be discussing Brown Album and we are delighted to be joined by the book's author, Horachista Kakpur, and also by author Human Maj. Tonight's program was organized in conjunction with the exhibition Rebel, Juster, Mystic Poet, Contemporary Persians, the Mohammed Afkami Collection. The exhibition is currently on view at Asia Society Museum in New York through May 8, 2022. We also have a virtual tour on our website. Further information about both the exhibition and tour can be found at the link in the chat. We are thrilled to be joined tonight by our Asia Society members and also to have partnered with several wonderful organizations that share in the mission of championing the lives, voices, and art from Asia and the Asian diaspora. Thank you to our co-host, Asian American Writers Workshop, especially Lily Philpot, who is my co-conspirator behind this event. Thank you also to our presenting partners, both Asia Society Northern California and Asia Society Southern California. It's been a great coast to coast collaboration. And to our book club partners, we want to thank MISNA and Asia Art Archive in America and Asian American Arts Alliance, both organizations who have now teamed up with us for multiple book clubs. I also want to thank our moderators who you'll meet later on for holding space for this community. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our host, Porachista. Porachista's debut novel, Sons and Other Flammable Objects, was a New York Times editor's choice, one of the Chicago Tribune's Falls Best, and the 2007 California Book Award winner in the first fiction category. Her second novel, The Last Illusion, was the 2014 Best Book of the Year, according to NPR and many more. Among her many fellowships is the National Endowment for the Arts Award. Her nonfiction has appeared in many sections of the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Elle, Slate, Salon, and Book Forum, among many others. Porchista's full bio can be found at the link in the chat. And we're so honored to have her here. We've been looking forward to this event for quite a while. So I'm happy to pass it over to her. And okay, now over to you, Porchista. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah um, and everyone at Asia Society. Um, it's just, it's a real honor. I always really loved Asia Society. I also love that I'm here with my friend, Human, who's just such an amazing, amazing writer and have been an amazing ally and support and blurb this book. So it's just very happy and, and comfy to be here with you all. <laughs> um, also, if you were in the New York area and you haven't seen the exhibit, um, the Rebel Gesture Mystic Poet, uh, I saw it right when it opened, um, like literally the day of, and it was just so well done. It's really, really amazing. So I highly recommend it. It's a really it's very difficult, I find, to display like contemporary Persian art in a way that's really meaningful, both to an Iranian audience as well as a non-Iranian audience. And it just does it in such a nice, balanced, um, beautiful way. So I really enjoyed it. Asia Society is just a must, must visit always um, in New York. So that's great. Um, okay, so, so yeah, thank you so much for being here. I'm just gonna say a few words um, before you know we break up and then we come back together. Um, so Brown Album, this came out right in the middle, well, right in the beginning of the pandemic, I should say. It was May 2020, and so I had this very beautiful book tour that was planned. My publishers at the Knopf Double Day Group had a really magical, um, you know, I was, I was stopping all over the country, and it was going to be really, really wonderful, and then suddenly it turned into this, you know, I remember thinking in March of 2020, maybe by May 2020, the pandemic will be over, <laughs> which sounds really crazy now thinking about it. But um, so it, it's, I've had a, a sort of strange experience where most of my reactions from people have been online. Um, and prior to that, I 
was severely ill. I, some of you may know me from another book called Sick, my memoir that came out right before this. Um, I wrote two novels and then a memoir, Sick. Um, I've been chronically ill for years and I only like this, it sounds like I'm making it up, but I got better from years of illness in February of 2020. And so March, 2020, we had the pandemic. So I, it's been years that I've been like, you know, a normal person in the universe. So I just feel very lucky to be here and be able to discuss it. Brown Album was actually a book that was recommended. How should I even say it? In 2009, I was doing quite a few um, essays in the New York Times. Uh, my first novel had come out in 2007 and the paperback in 2008. And by the time the paperback came out, you know, it had been an editor's choice and paperback row and all that stuff in the New York Times. And a New York Times editor wrote me and said, hey, do you want to write an essay for us? We're doing a special series. We're actually in general trying to get literary writers more into the op-ed section. It's not historically been a section for literary writers. And I thought, huh, you know, it's always been my dream to be in the New York Times. I was just barely 30. And um, I thought, wow, okay, sure, I'll do an essay. I wasn't even an essayist at that point. I had been a journalist for many years. In my 20s, I was primarily known as a music journalist, um, a bar columnist, an arts and entertainment writer. Um, I did a lot of celebrity features, stuff like that. So fashion, all that stuff. But I had really not really ever written an essay since like high school, you know, and there wasn't the same market for essays as you see today. So you didn't have a lot of young women as you see publishing essay collections all over the place. So when my um, my first New York Times essay came out, it had a pretty good reaction. This is prior to our vocabulary of like things going viral. You had most emailed, most shared. And it was sort of like a hit. And then they asked me to write a second essay and, and they I sort of didn't get really a lot of instruction. It was just sort of implied that they wanted to hear more about like Iranian American issues, maybe similarly, you know, I'd written an essay that was sort of funny about my Iranian American family in California. And, um, you know, they said something like that again, you know, basically it's just like repeat it. It's, and they just hadn't had a lot of Iranian American writing in the office section, certainly not writing personal essays like that. So then I did another one and then it just continued. I wrote one after another. So in 2009, you know, pretty much 2009 solidly through 2000, uh, 2012, maybe I was just having essay after essay in the New York times. And then that branched out in years to come and many other, um, uh, publications, but eventually I was in four sections of the New York times. And so editors started to notice this. And I, I still remember, um, Robin Desert Knopf who's a very high up senior editor there. Um, she, when we were shopping around my second book, which was a novel, um, she said, you know, does Port used to have like an essay collection? Cause that's what I'd like to see by her when she rejected the second novel. And I was like, I'm like 30. Like, why would I have an essay collection? Cause at that point, you know, we didn't have a Gia Tolentino's or Leslie Jameson's or all these like books that you see today. I, there was just no model for me of a young woman publishing essays. You know, I just thought maybe that's something you did when you were really famous and really old. And I was still pretty new to essays. I was very, frankly pretty surprised that my essays were getting um, read, you know, and, and read widely. It just seemed to me like, you know, and there were very few Iranian American writers that I really related to. Human was one of the only ones actually I was reading at the time. And he gave me a sort of model for that, but his, um, his style also, like he, he was able to go to Iran and back. And so, you know, and I was reading his stuff in the New Yorker, which to me was like another higher tier than the New York Times. So I was just like kind of in awe of him. I probably met him around that time. And I was like, oh, you know, he was so supportive. Um, so anyways, it like, in other words, this was suggested a long time ago. And this didn't come out until, a, you know, like nearly a decade after it was suggested by Knopf. And, and hilariously enough, it actually sold to Knopf again. So this is a vintage imprint of Knopf. And uh, Robin didn't take it, but she passed it on to another editor there, who's my current editor. They did a two book deal with me in 2018. So my next novel is with them too. Um, and I happened to be very sick during the time, right after the book deal, I basically became severely ill. And that had to do with my prior publishers and the book tour for um, Sick, a memoir where I was too sick to complete the book tour. Basically I was collapsing at different stops on the, mem on the book tour. 
and HarperCollins was fairly relentless and sort of wanting me to be a, you know, a racehorse basically. So um, I was very ill when this book was being put together. And so I really owe it a lot to my editor and even um, publicity and marketing and, and the whole team over there for helping put this together. Because putting an essay collection together is a little bit more tricky than it seems. Like when I shopped this around, what I just did was I opened a word file and I just cut and paste every Iranian American essay I had. I just threw it into a file. You know, there were a few maybe that I didn't include, but for the most part, I did it. And I was sort of just to show myself like, wow, here's 300 pages on a Microsoft Word file of all these essays I've written. And in some instances, I was able to use like edits that were, um, you know, my, my own, need, you know, because there's, of course, that compromise. These are all, there's so many different publications represented in this book, and they all have their different styles. So, you know, I, I was able to like, look back on my original drafts and, but it was a mess, you know, and you can't just throw in a bunch of essays and say this is a collection. So my editor was really helpful during a time that I was sick to, to like help me sculpt this and help me like um, edit for continuity, not repeat certain things. Also, when you're an essayist, you constantly have to introduce yourself to your audience. Like you have to like in, you know, it's sort of like the journalistic nut graph. You sort of give the thesis, but you also have to give a little bit of background and give a sense of why this piece is being published and why we want it to be read. And, and so there's a lot of like sleight of hand that has to be done to make an essay successful. So if you have a collection and these essays are, you know, these are essays from over a decade and they're all different styles and different publications. You just, there's a lot that goes on in trying to make it sort of cohesive. And I'm a novelist by nature. So I know how to write a book, um, but I don't, I wasn't totally convinced I knew how to put together an essay collection. And I don't know if I still do, you know, I, I read essay collections all the time and I find them really joyful, but I sort of like pick and choose. I don't read them in a linear way. Um, I just find them sort of delightful because you can dip in and out without the sort of like anxiety of like continuity or having to read it all in one gulp. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the thing. And, and I think the one thing that was kind of funny in writing this was there was never the question of like, oh, is this gonna be a relevant book? And I thought since I was a child, I have never experienced that to be a central question in my identity. And I thought, how neat, how few people can say that, right? I have always been relevant since I've come to America. I'm sure Human can, you know, relate to this sentiment that we have never really, um, you know, not for good reasons, usually. <laughs> We've never really gone out of style. Iran continues to be a hot topic. It has my entire lifetime because I'm basically as old as a revolution. You know, I'm turning 44 in a month. So, you know, my birth date basically is just right before the revolution and then right before the war. So, you know, my entire lifetime, Iran has been in the news. So there was never that sort of awkward discussion that marketing publicity has to have or anyone else, you know, agents and editors where they're like, will people like even know what this is? Or because even bigots who hate Iran, they, they know quite a bit about Iran. <laughs> you know, they make sure they know some things about Iran. So you know, even when we talk about like, has, you know, Iranian identity, Iranian American identity emerged or is there a readership or all these things? I think one thing we're not talking about is relevance because it continues to be in the discourse in some way or another. So, you know, I guess the only question that was left for me was like, was this the right point in my timeline in releasing a book of essays? And, you know, I, I think nowadays with the market being such with, with nonfiction, um, you know, there could always be a part two. I, I really thought when I wrote this that I would stop writing nonfiction. I'd written a memoir, you know, in 2018, and then this came out in 2020, essays. And I just thought, let's just stop. No more. Because I started to feel like I was repeating myself. Um, but, you know, hilariously, just as I thought that, like when this book came out, I just was writing a whole bunch of new essays, you know, suddenly this publication, that book, can you write another essay, you know? So I continue to write essays. Um, but what's nice is I also have released myself a little bit from it too. And I'm, I've like gone back to investigative journalism, which is a real true love of mine and arguably my strongest suit as a writer, uh, maybe with fiction. But um, I think also, well, we can talk about this later, but, you know, I think also the thing that maybe surprises people is that I don't necessarily love the personal essay form. 
So that's also a little bit of an awkward thing when you're like trying to sell a essay collection to people. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't really, I don't love it. It's not that I don't love it. It's just that I'm a little suspicious of the form. And that's probably tied to issues of commerce and, and, and sort of like cultural digestibility of the essay. So a lot to talk about. Um, we will now go into the next portion, um, the conversation and Q&A with Porchista, moderated by author Human Majd. Human is an author and writer based in New York and a contributor at NBC News. He has written for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Time, Newsweek, The Financial Times, and Interview Magazine, among others. Majd is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Ayatollah Begs to Differ, and The Ayatollah's Democracy. His most recent book on Iran, The Ministry of Guidance Invites You to Not Stay, was published in 2013. And we will be dropping his full bio in the link at the chat. So before passing it off to Human, I just wanted to remind everyone that this is now the portion where we will take your questions via the chat. So please drop your questions into the Q&A. If anything came up from your breakout room discussions, we'd love to hear it. Or if you had thoughts that you didn't get a chance to share in the breakout rooms just now, we'd love to um, read them and share with one another. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Human. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, people who were in my breakout room and hi to people who weren't. And Porishista, my dear, dear friend. Um, Porishista, one of the things that um, we'll, we'll start a little conversation now and then maybe take some questions in about five, 10 minutes. Is that good for you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that came up, which was, I found was interesting in, in, in um, my breakout room, was uh, an Iranian-American uh, said that she had never considered herself brown and was curious as to why, as much as she enjoyed the book, uh, why you titled it Brown Album. And I immediately said, I didn't think brown referred necessarily to the, to the you know, the the, the tint of our skin, um, that it was being the other. And, and I think that being the other in a society where there is a definition of whiteness, let's say, without trying to be offensive about it, but there is a definition of whiteness. Uh, you and I don't fit in into that whiteness. Um, for, you, for, for me, it's a, it was a little bit different because I've come from a previous generation where I experienced life as an Iranian not an Iranian American, as an Iranian living in America and going to college, and then the revolution happened, and then eventually becoming an Iranian American, and um, you experience it completely differently. Um, so I, I, I think it's important for for people to understand where that concept comes from of being the other, which is you you, you do it so well in the book in terms of explaining how that feeling was in, in all your essays. But I think it's, it's useful to talk about it here. Yeah, um, well, thank you for asking that. This is a question that comes up so often. And like, I really, part of the reason why I named it, what I named the Sina Brown album is because this has become such a big question for Iranians and non-Iranians alike. Like, what are we? Like, where do we fit in? And this issue of identity, I soon realized, you know, like I said, I'm turning 44 next month. I soon realized probably like in my late twenties, early thirties, that I was going to have to answer that question for myself. And if I was going to be like a writer and public figure and like, you know, and I was like a published journalist at a really young age, you know, I was 19 when my first piece came out in the village voice. So I'd been public for quite a while. I just realized I'm going to have to define that very vocally and loudly for myself. And luckily I had a dad that at a very young age said, well, first of all, you're Asian. Remember that, you know, when there's a box to check off, you know, only recently there's been some Middle Eastern boxes to check off, but it's like, you know, Asian, you're Asian. And he also did use the term brown. And so that was like, it, I didn't realize at the time it was really to push back against a lot of this sort of Iranian obsession with whiteness, which is another reason, again, why I, I named it this. But, you know, we have the term gandum gong, you know, which is like wheat colored which literally is brown. Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of Iranians, like I don't think in Iran, 
I think there's a very problematic way that you could latch onto whiteness as an Iranian in Iran. But I think the term Gandongan too is a very like common term, you know, to just say that we are brown and to see a certain pride in that. Um, and I think that I just felt like in 2020, right, when this book came out, that like culturally we're at a point where we just really have to abandon our attachment to whiteness because it's not getting us anywhere, you know? Like, like you said, we're not really included whether we like it or not. Um, and that comes from obviously negative portrayals in the press, but also just like confusion over like the identity. And if, if there's no confusion in our neighbors in Afghanistan, Pakistan, all around us, they don't have a lot of conflict saying brown. I just don't understand. And I don't and I don't feel invested in Iranian exceptionalism. You know, I, I, I don't love that thing that occasionally people will be like, well, you know, the only non-Arabs in the Middle East are, you know, Iranians and Israelis and Turks. And it's like, OK, well. I don't care. That doesn't that doesn't mean anything to me. I I don't want to participate in anti Arab stuff. You know, there's so much that we can like constantly define ourselves against. So I wanted to be proactive in defining myself for something. If that makes no, sense. that 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 makes perfect sense. But also, I mean, the fact that your parents chose your name for yeah. a very unusual name, even within the Iranian. Yes. Uh, Iranian population. Um, I, I would, uh, I would venture that most Iranians have never heard that name. Oh yeah, and especially it's today in this, in this day and age. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and it's totally unpronounceable to Iranians too. So when people are like, you know, Americans are like, oh, sorry, I can't say your name. It's like no one can. Really. <laughs> and so, like, again, it's a testament to my dad, who really was like, and I, and I don't think I realized this until much later in life why my dad was so. So, so able to like know himself and it really came from like years and, and and decades of all sorts of bigotry and xenophobia and I had thought just in the west but later when I realized like his whole like background you know his ethnic and genetic background I realized like that even goes back further from when he was in Iran and a more darker skinned Iranian um so yeah, I no, I mean it's 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 a testament to your dad, but it's also on your and your your mom that it's also a testament to yourself that you chose to go with that name um, yeah. <laughs> and and not take a little a nickname like a lot of and I don't blame them a lot of Iranians who've either changed their name or taken a nickname and used right. that throughout and it happened a lot more again you know I come from one generation before you so uh, you know after the revolution a lot of Fereidun's became Fred's because they just <laughs> didn't want to deal with it you know a lot of Mohammed's became Mo and yeah. um and 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 it, that was just to get through life whether they were a taxi driver whether they were you know a waiter in a restaurant or whether they were just starting out in a business somewhere um it it but, you know, it's it's interesting because, you know, I was working in the entertainment business and I was in uh, London one time at a dinner party, a, a, a non-Iranian, completely just an entertainment business party. And I happened to be sitting next to a, a British woman who introduced herself and then I introduced myself and she said, oh, where are you from? And I said, New York, just, just came out, New York. That's where I was from. That's where I worked. And she said, oh, but I mean, where are you really from? Right. <laughs> so then I realized, I mean, that just made me at that point realize that, you know, it's always going to be the case. Where are we really from? We're Iranian Americans. We're Americans. But where are you really from? Right. And you either have to, you know, and you obviously have accepted that. But your essays also talk a lot about that conflict. And that conflict is is there. And I don't know. I do feel that that conflict will ever go away. Or is it just something that's going to be part of your part of your existence, part of your being. Right. A, it, not just as a writer, but as a person. Yeah. When I would say, I was just thinking too, like, I remember one time someone saying, like, they had seen, like, we, Ihuman and I and some of our journalist friends in New York would have these, like, gatherings of, like, Iranians, um, like, monthly uh, for a few years. And we were, someone said to me, well, I can see how you and Human are friends. It's a lot easier for you guys and I said, well, what do you mean? It's a lot easier for it. Said, they said, well, we understand. It's, it's clear to me how you guys fit in in New York. And it was such some sort of vague, I sort of like probed them. And I was like, I'm not sure what you mean by that. And it was like, well, no, no, you guys are more like Western friendly. And like, I could see how in New York, you guys would like, there's a cosmopolitan, it was some bizarre thing. And it's just like such a funny Rorschach test when you think about Iranian-ness and whether it's a Western person or just non-Iranian or an Iranian, they're just going to put so much baggage on it, yeah. um, you know, and it's just we get all sorts of weird pushback from Iranians 
all the time. You know, in some mm-hmm. ways, I think you've had the experience that I've also had where it's actually sometimes easier for like a white American to see you and accept you than sometimes your own your own people. No question. No question. Yeah. It is, it's so maddening and it's so painful and it's so weird because you're like, like, how can you not see me or how can you not be proud or how can you know? Uh, but it's it's. It's it's a very very complicated thing. I think it has to do with being like a newer diaspora, um, a newer immigrant group. Though of course, you know, there's been like you know Iranians here earlier too. I mean, I don't know. It's you did. I feel like you're like one of the trailblazers and having been in like your generation too. I mean, you also could have changed your name to like I don't know Howard <laughs> or something, right. but you didn't. I mean, your name gets mispronounced too, and so all the time, I, yeah. Yeah, I felt like you and 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 really just very few people, but like, you were a big one for me. It was a real you were a real model for like how to conduct myself like no, in the West. Too kind, no, no, too kind. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, you know, this when I got when I got kind of caught up in the music business and I'm an executive in the music business. I was following what's happening in Iran as we all did, everybody did, regardless of you know. Where are you from? I mean, <laughs> there was one time in the music business, which was, you know, obviously a business that it, it, it had had less bigotry than some other businesses in it. Um, one day I was in a meeting and somebody said, said something about something in the Middle East. And I made a comment about Iran. And the guy said, well, what do you know about Iran? I said, where do you think my name comes from? He said, California. He had assumed, oh my he had assumed that my parents were hippies and had named some oh, weird wow. name so there there is you know there's different experiences that we've always all had but i think this at the end of the day something that is i think we all probably figure unless you were just born here recently i would say in the last 20 years um is this this sense that we aren't sure where our home is do you get that feeling Oh yeah. It's funny. Like in a way, like my home, I've always thought of it in a more abstract sense, like the arts, for instance. Mm -hmm. And just as you were talking, I thought, I wonder if it like are both having been in the music industry, you know, me as a music journalist and you doing the work you did is exactly. I wonder if that made our entry then into like politics a little bit like, or I, we shouldn't even say politics, but like into journalism, let's say, right. or, or a more like political sphere, for instance, like um, maybe it made it a little bit more smooth because like you're actually right that there is less bigotry in those industries. And so people are less prone to care like, oh, where does your name come from or who are, you know, like it, it there's a there's a way in which I don't know, like maybe because mm-hmm. of. I can think of so many reasons. I mean, maybe because of um, black music being so predominant. Largely because of black music. Yeah, I mean, that was the first subculture that I Mm -hmm. felt was accepting Mm -hmm. of us here. You know, I never had problems with black Americans the way I had with white Americans. They might not have ever met an Iranian, but there would be a respectful curiosity. But there was a way in which, like, I will never forget that that moment in the early 80s where just white people hated us and really openly it was mainstream too and that i was just a very young child then i thought how bizarre the hostage crisis iranians right. go home yeah. yeah and it was just like that was my first view of americans when i got here and so often people will say to me like why do you write so much about being marginalized or why do you experience that feeling so much it's like that's what i came to america knowing and that's how i learned english like mm-hmm. through people hating us and so and that didn't go away really, you know again like i said earlier like there's never been a great time to be running in america it's always been like a hot topic but not really in the way you really you want always like that feeling of like you're at a party or you're at an event and like people are like oh like where's your name from or like where are you from and it's like there's a sigh that i always feel like Iran, you know, and I was yeah. like, okay, like, and now I'm gonna have to look at them in the eye and search into their eyes a little bit and see like, what's the expression there or like, oh, I'm gonna have to make a weird joke or nervously laugh like, I don't think everybody has to deal with that if you're like, you know, I don't know, like, Swedish, I don't think you have to constantly deal with that. I don't know. It's, it's very frustrating. So for me, like, the home question always ended up being like far more abstract and being like, 
the arts, experimental writing, um, you know, things like that, music, hip hop, whatever. And, and so I had to define myself in a cultural context more than like an ethnic one and certainly more than in like a nationalistic one because I didn't become American until I was 23. And even then I was so reluctant. It was, it was such a humiliating experience having to go into that Brooklyn federal court and sing like America the Beautiful and then have to prove that I could write the words today is a sunny day on a piece of paper in my immigration interviews when I was already a published journalist. And so I just like felt, I don't know. So yeah, I don't know if I'll ever feel like that, that sense of total comfort. The, I, I think there's a, there, yeah, no, I think I, I, I'm with you on that because I think um, in both our cases, I mean, in your case, again, younger, but um, I never had a home in, because my father was a diplomat, so we always traveled around. So when the revolution hit and he lost his job and he lost his, he never had a home because he was traveling around the world all the time. And I was just going to American schools and all different kinds of places. I didn't have this concept of home. And I thought one day I would because I'd never assumed that I would stay in America. I always thought I'd at some point go to Iran and, and, and work and live there and have a home. But you know how people say, you know, um, you know, you, all our American friends, oh, what are you doing? I'm going home for Thanksgiving. I'm going oh, yeah. home, even if they hate their home, even if they hate, but they have this concept of home. It could be rural Wisconsin. It can be LA. It can be anywhere in America, but there's this concept of home, even if you don't like it we don't even have that concept. I, I, I don't. My home is my suitcase. Um, yeah. and, and if and I, I don't want to be too dramatic about it, but if I ever have to get up and leave because, you know, and this has happened twice in my lifetime where there was a, a, a serious idea that we could either be interned like the Japanese were. Okay. I mean, the media was seriously talking about that <laughs> or that, you know, we could be deported before I became a U.S. citizen. Uh, I remember having to go down to immigration during uh, the, during the uh, Iraq hostage crisis in, in 1980 and uh, sign up to say where I was and how I could be reached in case they needed to deport me. <laughs> you know? so, uh, so I think this concept of home is, is something that um, is, is, a, is a difficult one for us. And I think that even though it's not specifically the subject of your book, but in your book, that it's there. It's there because you don't feel at home wherever you are, whether it's in Pasadena or in New York. Right. You know, it's funny. Um, I was just thinking too, like, like even I just remembered like calling you a few years ago, it must've been like a handful of years ago. Um, and, and there was even a moment where I experienced the horror of like, they were saying naturalized citizens. Yeah could yeah. be scooped up and I just remember thinking like well what was the point of becoming American that, the whole point was like that was I, I didn't have a lot of impetus I wanted to vote I guess but like yeah. I, I just didn't want to like have to worry in that way and I remember like I still remember it was like a Saturday night or something it was like nighttime I was calling you and I was like oh my god am I gonna are we gonna have to worry about this are we gonna go to Muslim camp <laughs> And you were like, no, oh, but, uh, you know, and you just, there's always so much consoling you can do because the Trump administration, like, years were so, like, uncertain. Not that they're totally certain now, but um, that that idea that, like, naturalization really could be meaningless yeah. as, as long as you belong to certain, you know, groups. Yeah, it's happened before. It's happened before. Right. Right. Well, I want to, I want to, um, since we have about 20 minutes, I thought we might want to take some questions from people um, and, and see what kind of reactions and or comments and or questions people may have. So I'm going to open it up. If anybody has a um, question, could you please unmute and perhaps raise your hand or something like that? Sarah, how would you like to do this in terms of questions? Would you like people to raise their hands officially in the... Uh, zoom style or can they just kind of like join in sure if they if you would rather ask your question by turning on your mic you can raise your hand via you know zoom i think if you hover over your name and you select more you can raise your hand or you can type your question into the chat and we can take it there so either right. one works So anyone, please? If no one asks a question, it's just gonna be me and Porchista <laughs> yapping <you> away. 
<laughs> it might even go past 9 30 and you're going to be forced to stay on and listen to us talk all night that's fine with me <laughs> yeah. we're over Anyone? somebody must have a question i always have questions oh yeah someone does someone does good yes i see Hi, Parachista. My name is Marjan. I was in Mr. Maj's uh, chat room um, and I brought it up there. I'll bring it up with you. Um, first of all, very nice to meet you. My congratulations to you for all your success. Um, and as I brought it up again in, in our chat room for being named uh, among prominent Iranian Americans in this country. Um, another source of pride for us. Um, I felt this is your first, uh, the first book of yours that I read. Um, and I will continue on to read what you wrote prior to this. Um, I felt reading this uh, a certain amount of anger and correct me wherever I'm wrong, uh, whether it be anger slash frustration and anxieties that I felt you've always carried with you. And uh, you came here as a very young child. What do you think made you carry all of this for so long? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think I only discover more and more um, about this question as I get older and like realize like the effects of trauma. I mean, I think they say technically that like in the first three years of your life, it's really important that children are like sort of sheltered from like adversity, basically, whether it's like war or like just poverty or whatever it is. But those are really formative years, even though most people think of like a, you know, a child from zero to three is like nothing, right? But they, they absorb everything. And those were like probably the most traumatic years of my life. And I have memories at two and a half, like very vivid memories, which most people don't have. But my memories are very precise, uh, you know, and my, they can be verified, you know. And so, and they're memories of wartime and, and revolution and absolute panic with my parents. And for my parents, they had been fairly like affluent and um, comfortable prior to the revolution. And so for them, it was like, you know, my mom was in her late 20s and my dad was in his early 30s. And so this was like, they had no idea what to do. They were falling apart. And I was like their only child and very, like you said, very, very young. But and I was just absorbing everything and suddenly realizing that I was going to have to grow up really differently than, than they had or other children had. And so then the first few years of like me, like coming to sort of consciousness, right, as a toddler even, involved us very literally fleeing. Sometimes Iranians use the term fleeing. For those of you who don't know Iranians, sometimes they'll say we fled, but they didn't really flee, but we really did. We really, we were one of those families that like just packed up two suitcases and were in buses and trains and going through like Turkey to Europe and just really had no plan. And uh, as my parents really never had to think about like what their future was gonna look like, they worked for the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran where they met. My great uncle was deputy prime minister there who's very prominent um, in the sense taken care of by the Shah. Um, and so they just didn't really, they weren't really prepared for like what the, all the uncertainties of life. Um, and so I sort of, my entry into the world was just pure adversity. So, you know, I've had a lifetime of like anxiety disorder, panic disorder, depression, all that stuff. And I just, I, I don't think I even realized till later in life that it wasn't normal for a child in elementary school to cry every single day and to be suicidal constantly. Like that to me, like now that I'm older, I'm like, oh my God, that's so horrible. But I have so many diary entries. Cause I actually, it's what's interesting is I really thought to document it at a very young age too. I knew there was something culturally and historically significant about what we were going through. But what I didn't recognize is that my feelings were unusual. And that was not, this is pre the era of everybody going to therapy or getting meds or whatever. I don't think my parents would even let me go on psych meds or anything like that. But I just remember coming home from school every day and just crying for hours and wishing I was dead. And the, my only, the only thing that saved me was like focusing on my academics. 
whereas I think there's such a discourse in like the West about like, oh, tiger parents being abusive or like worrying about school is terrible. <laughs> that saved my life. School was the best thing for me. Like worrying about math homework or like, you know, reading like a million books a week or like I was such an overachiever academically, like really intense nerd. Like my parents put way less pressure on me than I did. I had to get straight A's. I had to be top of my class all the time. Um, so that that was very much like my outlet. But I was really like distraught. And then, you know, we were in an area in California that was not populated heavily by Iranians. So there's a lot of like cultural like disconnect in my school and people didn't know who, like what to make of me and my name. And like, you know, the fact that I spoke a different language, I brought foreign food to class for, for the first I was in ESL, you know, it was, there's so much like emphasis on the differences. And then like, I go home and the news would just be all about Iran and I'm like, oh, here I am suicidal anyways, for reasons I didn't understand, you know, there was no conversation around trauma. You know, I was always shaking as a kid, like constantly, like, like um, I had tremors and, and no one really like worried about like, oh, you should go to the doctor or I was painfully skinny and I was eating all the time. But there's, there's clearly things wrong with me. But my parents couldn't really afford to think about that. They couldn't afford in a literal sense, but they also couldn't psychologically afford to have more problems with their like firstborn child falling apart. But there's so much evidence that I was like falling apart. And it wasn't really until I was like 18, I went to college in New York, that I started to really act out. And that's when I was like, you know, into clubbing and partying and drugs and, you know, all the anxiety and the trauma then like went into this other direction, which was equally problematic, but like in a weird way, it also like kind of saved me too. I, I experienced also for the first time in my life, not being academic. You know, I was not top of my like school and college and I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be part of the nerds. I wanted to be a cool person in New York city. <laughs> That's what mattered to me. I wanted to be cool and beautiful. And suddenly I was getting like modeling gigs and I was like a party kid. And I was like being seen as something completely different. And, and, and the nineties was a much more inclusive time than the 80s had been, I think, for Iranians, but certainly in, in the East Coast, at least, you know, I felt much more accepted and there was something kind of prideful about being other. So I explored lots of different marginalized identities with a lot of pride. So, and, and that I think was really life-saving for me. Great, well, it's a good, that's a good, a good answer. We have a question from Mimi, Mimi Yu, um, and she's curious about the organization of the book for she said. Um, as yeah the book you know it's it was really difficult to know how to put it together like I guess my editor had a pretty strong hand in it like for instance like starting it off with that Shaws of Sunset essay was not my choice and when she suggested that I was like ooh, I don't know if I want to start with that essay but she made an argument that like that's where you introduce the term Persian versus Iranian and, and where you fall on that discussion I fall on the Iranian end. And so that was like, I was like, okay, well, that's fine. And, you know, um, that was actually before I knew I was going to be working on a Shaws of Sunset memoir. So that's kind of funny. That's just happened in the last year that I'm writing Reza Farhan's uh, memoir. Um, but, you know, that, so that I didn't really think of that when that came in first. And then it was sort of like, you know, the way part one and part two are divided, it was sort of like chronological, but at the same time, most of my essays don't follow a linear chronology even within the essays. So they sort of spiral in and out of time. So it was like very, it was actually surprisingly difficult. I, I do think essay collections are much harder than they look. I think the public probably thinks you just like slap a bunch of essays together and put a title <laughs> and sell it. But it was actually like a lot harder and involved a lot more like original writing or even digging to like original drafts and like figuring out how to restore, but also like some things had simply gotten outdated, you know? Um, and some things were better received now than they were then. Like for instance, I have an essay called The King of Tarantulas about Bijan. And Bijan is like this iconic fashion designer, very much known in Tarantulas. Um, for his like iconic yellow and this big Rodeo Drive store. And, and he'd had all these ads in the 80s that were like, he was a, kind of like a breakthrough Iranian ads with like Bo Derek and, and, and Michael Jordan. And he was just very popular. And I think when I wrote, it was kind of like an obit that I wrote about him in, I think it was in Salon. Um, I think like there wasn't a lot of interest really. Like, I don't know, people, that essay wasn't like a year very, like well circulated essay but then for some reason I don't know why in 2020 
a lot of people like kept asking me about that essay and people were suddenly rediscovering Bijan and even wanting to talk about some things that I didn't even really approach in the essay because they were so like problematic. Like, you know, Bijan had a strange sort of racial politics and the fact that he featured Bo Derek when she was wearing, you know, braids, box braids at a time when, you know, that wasn't really what white women did, but also like Bo Derek's whole reception with that was very mixed, right? Um, there was, a, and then, you know, having Michael Jordan as ads and also like him, like, ident you know, being visibly much browner than a lot of other Iranians too. And, and sort of being very proud of being Iranian, but also being kind of conservative as an Iranian. And probably my guess is somewhat anti-Muslim. It's just a guess, you know, my feeling of Tarantulas is that sort of. So I don't know, like, like over time, I did a podcast about Rodeo Drive. It's a really sort of funny podcast they had about fashion and Rodeo Drive. And they interviewed Bijan's son and they had me talk about that essay. And I was so nervous about it because I thought maybe my portrayal of Bijan is sort of unflattering and his son is going to be on this podcast. And I don't know, I just don't think I should be a spokesperson for Rodeo Drive because I was writing about it as a shop girl. as like a low income shop girl on Rodeo Drive who worked across the street from the Bijan store. And Iranians would look down on me because they would say like, oh, Hanum, you know, like, young girl, what happened to you that you're like a shop girl? That's very shameful for an Iranian, especially in that district, right? So yeah, it was like, suddenly I was on this podcast and it was like, great. And people were sort of into the kitsch and carnivalesque aspect of, of Bijan. And I still like when I post like Bijan ads on like Instagram or something, people love it. They think he's kind of fabulous and amazing and larger than life. So some well, of the essays have aged better than others. I don't know. No, I think they all, they've all aged very, very well. And I, I do think there is a, um, and thank you for that answer, Porchista. I think there is a, um, a kind of fascination now of Iran and Iranians that didn't exist so much. There was, you know, in the 80s, as you point out, there was a hatred. <laughs> then in the 90s, there was a little bit of an acceptance. Okay, they're here to stay. <laughs> we, kind of, we have to deal with them. They're kind of interesting. Uh, the 2000s, there was this like hiccup with, you know, the 9-11 and, oh my God, they're all horrible Muslims and we got to get- Axis of evil. Axis of evil. And then the nuclear thing and then Ahmadinejad, oh, Holocaust denial. And, you know, there's always this thing. And what I was saying in the one of the breakout, in the breakout room that I was in, I was saying, I think Iranians are unusual in that as a group of immigrants, we come from a country that is a, an enemy. That's is an absolute enemy. But unlike Cuban Americans who are fetid, and, you know, Soviets who came here are fetid, oh, they escaped that horrible place. It's, you know, the Iranians are not sure. You got to kind of make sure you, they want to know where you stand. Uh, did you like Ahmadinejad? Did you hate him? Did you, you know, right. Are you anti-Semitic? Are you for the Islamic Republic? Are you against it? It's sort of an unusual thing in, 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 yeah. the, in the immigrant community. And that is reflected, I think, part of in what Marjan was asking you about in the kind of frustration and the anger, I think that's just, it, it's there, it exists. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't go away. I think it, it's, uh, Bijan is a very interesting thing because you know his, uh, he, he, for a lot of Iranians, he was ridiculous. But for, on, on the other hand, he was also like, well, he, he, he beat the odds. I yeah. mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell a $10,000 suit that you can buy from George Armani for $1,000 only because I think I can get away with it because this is how ridiculous Rodeo Drive is. Yeah. And um, so there was something great about him despite the fact that he was, you know. And proud, so, right? And so yeah. proud of who he was at a time. With a heavy where, accent, with a heavy yeah. accent. When was Very short, you know, he was a small guy. And he, he leaned into that. I mean, his ads were always about like Michael Jordan being like yeah. several feet taller than him. And like, so he leaned into like, he's darker, he had a heavy accent, he was short, all these things that could be seen as really like part of the nasty Iranian stereotype. Yeah. He just leaned into and he had so much pride. And so I think we have to give credit to him for that. It's pretty amazing. Well, he also, I mean, I think there's also the fact that, it, you know, if you, if you turn the cliched Iranian upside down. You're driving a yellow Rolls Royce. You have a store in Beverly Hills. Yeah. You're hanging out with Bo Derek. Well, you, you must not be a mullah lover. Right. right. You know? totally. So, totally. so I think there yeah. was, there, there, well, there's that element. Well, but, and we but, always get credit for like how, like we get like extra credit points for how Western we, we are. Always. Like you and I posted a selfie, like, like the, which could easily happen, like us hanging out, like next month, whatever. And you and I are having a cigarette outside a trendy New York bar. 
we're going to get like a million likes on that. A million more likes than if you and I are sitting in a traditional, like we're outside a mosque oh. or, or like at a, or even like a beautiful, like Persian New Year sofa or something like that. No, but if, but if it was like, we look like hip and cool and sort of like whatever. Western. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've, I've told this, I mean, you could look it up. I was on Bill Maher once on, right. on, on HBO and it, I was being interviewed. Um, not on the panel, one of the other th occasions I was being interviewed. And yeah, I can't remember exactly how it got there, but um, he said something about uh, uh, Muslims and, uh, and, and drinking. And I said, well, I drink. He said, well, you're one of the good ones. Oh, right. um, <laughs> I didn't respond because I didn't want oh. to say, but, you know, but you're one of the good ones meant right. if you act like us, like a Judeo Christian white person, you're one of the good ones. And I think that attitude, I'm not even trying to blame him. I'm just trying to say that attitude does exist. And again, oh, yeah. you know, there's a reason why, you know, your essays, you know, resonate for someone who is a, the other, whether they're Asian, whether they're, you know, um, South American. I mean, I, I don't care as long as you're the other, uh, yeah. well, at least you're, at least you feel like you have been viewed by society, by your classmates in school, um, growing up or whatever, as the other, then I, I well, think, marginalization yeah. is so funny because it can be so painful. But like, if you are several margins removed, then it can actually turn into something acceptable. So, like for instance, like people will like like Westerners love that I have hand tattoos, or or that I drink, yeah. or that I did drugs, right. <laughs> that I hung out with certain like crazy celebrities, or like or if I'm chaotic online. Yeah. That scene is not typically Iranian. Right. If I were to wear like chador or hijab or like, you know, I have made posts about being Muslim. In fact, people just don't totally don't register that I'm Muslim. They don't want to believe it. Every time I post about being Muslim, it's like people just are like, well, we're not even going to talk about that. But it's like, that's kind of important to me. I believe in God, like all this, stuff, you know, this stuff. But it's like, it, it really is funny that like, because like we went a different path or like we somehow are on a certain margin that like can look cool then then, then it's okay because we're safe it's the industry it's the industries yeah. we're in you're a writer you're feted by the new york times um you know i was in the music but in the entertainment business then a writer yeah. journalist it's a it's it's you know it's that's the reason if you're yeah that's true i think uh um, I want to see if anybody else has, we have about two minutes left, I think, um, if anybody else wants to ask a question, because uh, we have an opportunity here with Porchista. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> or any questions on the, in that question that I asked before, the same Mimi also asked that your title obviously evokes Didion's white album yeah yeah exactly which is it for me like a very you know obviously i recognize her as important but in some ways it's like a little bit of pushback on <laughs> the Christian white didion right who, yeah who had a hand someone had something did someone have a hand up oh there he is bruce was that bruce having a hand up go ahead speak thank you oh thank you uh first of all poro chista congratulations uh, wonderful work. And Haman, thanks again for moderating. Uh, I haven't actually read the book yet, but I was on today reading some of the clips and some of the audio. It's just amazing, incredible. Yeah. Uh, so congratulations. I wanted to ask you, uh, I, I know I read a little bit about growing up in Los Angeles and what, in your opinion, brought such a large Persian community to Los Angeles when after all, it's further from Iran and the big centers of D.C., New York, Boston. What, what do you think about that? Well, and was there a presence before the revolution? Is that one of the reasons? Yeah, there, there was. But I think, I, and I think there's different theories on it, and Human probably can speak this better than I can, but I think there's so many different theories. I and mean, one of the very obvious theories is that, like, uh, Los Angeles and Tehran, or Los Angeles and, like, Iran, if you think of Iran as having a Mediterranean climate, Los Angeles is very similar in climate and even sort of visuals to Iran. Um, so that was, like, one reason. And then the fact that there had been some Iranian community there, Iranians went where the other Iranians were, basically. I mean, you had little pockets all over the place. We had pockets in like Virginia, DC area and Oklahoma, even Texas, you know, um, 
Boston, all over the country. But, you know, the fact that there were Iranians there, there was a similar climate, there were already like, you know, Iranian businesses there, they were thriving, you know, um, I think that was a big reason that like Iranians went to LA, right? Um, what is, uh, yeah, there also- were there were there were a lot of Iranian students mm. at USC and UCLA. Yeah. And the the families of those students came there right away. The Shah's sister had bought a huge estate in Bel Air um, and was known to have a property there and in Malibu as well, I believe. So there, there was always this fantasy of Hollywood, Los Angeles. And then my own personal feeling was that Truesdale looked like Shamroon, like right. <laughs> all the rich Iranians who descended on LA, they went up to Truesdale where all the you know 1960s homes were. And the homes were basically identical to the homes in the fancy part of Tehran. Um, and, uh, but yeah, there was, there, was a, there, there was a lot of reasons why, and Portuguese is absolutely correct. Um, visually, LA, uh, similar to Iran's, there's the valley in Iran's, Tehran's in a valley, like pollution, Tehran's very polluted, that you need a car to go everywhere because public transportation sucks. Same thing in LA. It was like almost like, okay, you just like transport. And, um, and, and the weather. Yeah, the weather had had some similarities, at least in you know three quarters of the year. Iran, Tehran has colder winters, but um, generally speaking, yeah, there, there there was a sense of, and you know, once you build a couple of businesses, start then everyone's like, oh well, okay, that's the place to go. It was also viewed as somewhere easy to kind of like get into. It. New York was always considered somewhere very difficult. Manhattan is like it's scary and difficult. How do you how do you raise a child there? You know, they're going to get mugged and killed in Central Park, you know. So. Right. There's like little Persia there, you know, West Woody Walk around. Uh, uh, Tarangelis might which is what my next book's called. I mean, that's like a real area there. And yeah. here's Farsi spoken everywhere on the street. And so it just feels very familiar, I think. And and Iranians have really made, I mean, people don't realize that there's the, I think it was a two-term mayor of Beverly Hills was Jimmy Del Shah, who was Iranian. Yeah, yeah. So they yeah. really are able to navigate LA in a much more concrete way than the rest of the country. Even though in some ways I would think like New York does have a certain appeal to Iranians, but it's just like, yeah, there's there's certain things about LA that just I don't know click with affluent Iranians. I would definitely say definitely with affluent Iranians and and people who thought that they could they could have it yeah. relatively easy and 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 the school district you know Beverly Hills school district if you could find an address in Beverly oh, yeah. Hills yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean there's there's a great people don't realize that Beverly Hills High was like a huge chunk of Beverly Hills High was Iranian sure. like, yeah. like yeah. very large percentage I don't I don't even know what it is today but I was shocked when I heard that originally it was like you know you just you you definitely were much more visible there yeah. for better yeah. or for worse I found the Iranians in LA to be traumatizing so I wanted to get away from them and I wanted to know like who the New York Iranians were like Oman and like that's all I cared about like they seemed cool like they were the ones who were wearing like the cool glasses and they were artsy and they were like in museums and cafes Whereas like the Tarantulas Iranians were like, I don't know, like they were like L.A. culture, you know, which I just didn't didn't like. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to pass it back to Sarah because I think we're past time. Um, and uh, just thank you, Porchista, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Sarah, I'm passing it on to you. OK, thank you so much, Iman. And that's what happens when you're among friends. I could just you know, <laughs> hang out with her. Yeah. She's- come on and hear them um we have sadly um needing to come to a close so i wanted to thank both of our speakers porchista and human thank you so much for sharing so openly it's such a special gift to especially in the midst of all this turmoil and crisis you know be able to connect and engage in this way that feels so full of care and i can't wait to see what else you all um, share with us in terms of your upcoming literary projects. So just thank you again. And thank you to all of our book club partners. Um, I see many of you in the audience. It's great um, that we have this ongoing connection through this initiative. And lastly, of course, to all of our attendees who joined tonight, um, we hope that you will join us for future book clubs and um, please stay in touch. It's an ongoing initiative and we hope to see you again. So thank you everyone. Thank you.
Thank you, you very much. Thank you for assisting. Great. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.